Thanks, Bliss. Yes, we're in the WRTI Performance Studio with Deborah Lou Harder at the piano. Thanks, Susan. It's so great to be here. It's kind of funny to be on the other side of the mic, though, I have to say. Uh, yeah, but this is so fun for us because Deb is playing selections from her new concert and conversation program, The Human Need for Melody, which she'll be playing at Music at Bunker Hill in Sewell, New Jersey, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So Deb is a professional pianist with degrees in both music and medicine and has loved to explore the intersection between music and science for a long time. And what better way to start this program when, than with the music of Bach? Let's start with the music of J.S. Bach, and I'll tell you just a little bit about it. It is the first movement from his Italian concerto, and it comes from a big compendium of keyboard masterworks he wrote. And he gave it the big title, Clavier Übung, which is keyboard practice. And it includes his six partitas, famous pieces like the Goldberg Variations, and this comes from part two of the Clavier Übung. Something very interesting about J.S. Bach is he was very modest. He said, never said he was a genius or a, a really great guy. He said, I just worked very hard. And he was always studying other composers. He very much admired his Italian contemporaries, even though he never stepped foot outside of Germany. So the piece I'm going to play you is actually a concerto in the Italian style. And what he does is take the sound of a Baroque orchestra with a solo group and he transforms that into music for a solo keyboard. And you can hear the joy and the boldness of the Italian style. I'm just gonna do the first movement of the concerto in the Italian style by J.S. Bach. Great. Thank you. 
<laughs> that was beautiful. You know, it, you. because this program that you're doing is about melody, mm -hmm. I found myself being aware that I was unconsciously singing along with that. Even as intricate as Bach's music is, you can find that and sing along. I was wondering um, what melody means to you because I think it's one of those things that we all think we know what it is. It's a sequence of notes that we find pleasing. And when I started looking it up, Googling it, that's what most of the definitions are. That's right. I mean, nobody can really agree on what the actual definition of a melody is. But the funny thing is we all know one when we hear one. It's so, um, oh, yeah, that is a great tune. And we get earworms. Certain parts of melodies just stick in our brains. And sometimes when you hear a song or a piece of music that that you loved when you were a teenager or when you were a child, it just brings you back to that particular time in your life. And that's why music and melody is so powerful. In the case of Bach, he was a master at layering many melodies together at the same time. He was a master at counterpoint. And in this Italian concerto, which I'll be performing in full on Sunday at Music at Bunker Hill, the slow movement contains one of the most gorgeous melodies that Bach ever wrote. And I'm sorry we don't have time to play it today, but um, it is an absolute masterpiece of melody. Wow. And um, why, how did you select the pieces on this program? Because we talked earlier about the fact that there are different kinds of melodies. Well, I wanted to pick pieces that all had melodies that evoke different kinds of emotion. So, for instance, I'll be playing uh, the Opus 101 of Beethoven, one of his late sonatas that contain so much feeling. You know, he was completely deaf at the time. He dedicated that sonata perhaps to his immortal beloved, and there's a lot of longing in that piece, but also a lot of triumph. And each piece on the program evokes a different kind of emotion and feeling. So I wanted to show the power of different kinds of melody in music. And how they touch us, and, and is there a scientific basis for that? Yes, there certainly is. It is amazing how much research has been done about why melody and music moves us as human beings. But nobody can come up with a definite conclusion. But the, the question of why music is so powerful to us has been debated for centuries, all the way back to the time of Plato, and perhaps even before that. Charles Darwin questioned, why do we love music so much? What benefit does it have to us as human beings? And in the research that I've been able to read about and um, investigate, it looks as if music and melody is actually essential to our survival as human beings. Wow. Well, we'll have to take that <laughs> up the <laughs> next break. Yes, I think we will. <laughs> uh, so the next piece you've chosen um, relates to the springtime in a way. Yes, it does. I've chosen to play Michio Miyagi's Sea in Springtime, and there's so many beautiful cherry blossoms in our area. Um, thinking about the Japanese Cherry Blossom Festival coming up in different parts of the world. Now, one thing that was fascinating in researching the power of melody is that there are certain principles of melody that hold true for all cultures around the world. Across all time periods, no matter how far away people are from each other, certain things every human being and every culture understands. For instance, the principle of an octave. This interval, the fifth, this one the fourth, this one the third. And they're basic frequency ratios in nature, meaning an octave is two to one, a fifth is three to two, a fourth is four to three, a third is five to four. <laughs> Not to get too nerdy about it or anything, but... <laughs> and. Every culture understands, especially the octave, and dividing that octave into separate pitches. So maybe we all are familiar with major and minor scales in the West, but there are many different kinds of scales, but they all understand certain basic principles, which I think speaks to the universality of melody and music as a human experience. So I wanted to show a piece from a different culture. This is The Sea in Springtime, as I mentioned, by Michio Miyagi. He was a blind koto player, and a koto is a probably the national instrument of Japan. It's a plucked instrument with 13 strings, sometimes 17, that sits on the floor in front of the musician. It was originally written for koto, this piece, and shakuhachi, which is Japanese flute. Okay. How and did you discover this piece? Well, this was very interesting. My parents were living in Orlando, Florida at the time, 
and we went on a little day trip to Bach Tower Gardens, which is a big botanical garden. They have a large tower, and I think they're related to the Bachs who you know, founded the Curtis Institute. Yes. In that tower is a carillon, which is played twice a day, and the carillon player was playing this piece. The, the melody was so haunting that um, I spoke to one of my piano students about it, who hunted down a version for piano and flute. Whoa. And I decided to transcribe it for solo piano. I love the meditative quality of this piece. So you can really rest and breathe easy as you listen to it. It also brings out not just the tranquili tranquility of the sea, but when it gets stormy and powerful, and then it comes back to a peaceful time as well. Oh. Let's hear it.
Paul. <laughs> That is great. If you're just joining us, I'm Susan Lewis in the WRTI Performance Studio with WRTI's own Deborah Lou Harder at the piano, playing from her program, The Human Need for Melody. And that melody from the Japanese composer was so evocative it and is. so mystical. Yes, so haunting. And um, it's very interesting to hear how different cultures produce melody, but they all create deep emotion in the listener. And that's what the power of music and melody is. And it enables us to connect with different cultures because mm -hmm. maybe that's based on their experience with nature and in the way they experience life, but it enables us to kind of bridge our different experiences. And it really is true that music is the universal language. I don't speak Japanese at all, but I can certainly understand this piece and be very moved by it. Well, it's so interesting. I have to say, this is so much fun because, Deb, you and I have known each other for a long time <laughs> in different have. contexts. Mm -hmm. Our kids grew Moms. up together. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, walks on the playground. And I, I'm just fascinated. I'm still learning new things about you. Could you talk a little bit about how you came to be studying both music and medicine? Well, I began with music. I mean, I've been playing music all my life and started piano lessons when I was about six years old. And uh, really pursued that very, very much. It was my passion. And I would just sit at the piano and doodle, you know, show tunes and opera and Broadway, as well as practicing serious classical music. And I was going to study at the Peabody Institute with Leon Fleischer. I got a scholarship when I was a junior in high school. But my parents were really concerned that I would never make a living as a musician. And they, they convinced me that I should really seek a broader education. So I... Um, enrolled in a wonderful six-year medical program where you go to two years of college and then do four years of medical school. But you don't have to um, do this the application process. So in a way, some of the pressure is taken off because you're already in the program. And I love medicine, but I found that when it was time to choose a residency and really get serious, I found that part of my soul was missing, that I just missed music so much that I decided to work part-time as a doctor and also pursue my doctorate in music under Earl Wilde, who's one of the great American virtuosos of the piano. I felt so fortunate to be able to study with him and learned an incredible amount. And um, later when I began concertizing, I found that people loved the music, of course, but they felt so much more connected to it when I would speak to them about the pieces. And especially when I would tie the compositions into larger themes that make meaningful sense to us as human beings in the social context and in scientific context, context as well. Right. For instance, asking the question, how did great composers like Beethoven or Chopin or Gershwin, who had suffered terrible illnesses, how could they create such great masterworks when most of us would just want to stay in bed? So <laughs> asking this question and doing the research makes the music even more powerful, and that's why I'm so excited to share programs like this. Well, it is so interesting because music doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, it's an expression of life. That's right. And so did your experience studying medicine inform your music and vice versa? Did your music inform your... I feel like my music informed my study of medicine because I think when you, when you study music, when you listen to music, when you love music, and functional MRIs and some of the scientific research that I've been mentioning show that the brain lights up whether you're participating actively or whether you are listening to music in very complicated ways. So all parts of your brain are engaged, including the part of your brain that processes emotion. So that's why I feel that when you listen to music, when you're very much tuned into it, that helps develop the emotional side of your nature, which is very exciting. It, it is exciting because people think of medicine as a field that works towards healing people. and we, we all say music heals, but it actually is true. It really is true. When you measure people's hormone levels, their stress hormones, their blood pressure, their immune function, listening to or actively participating, participating in music actually improves all those parameters. So it's a new field of study, neuromusicology and cognitive neuroscience of music. And, of course, we need more funding to help us uh, <laughs> bring that to the public. But And hopefully it will happen. Well, it is pretty exciting. What is the next piece you've chosen for us? Well, the last piece on the program today is by the wonderful French composer Francis Poulenc. He was one of the, the six composers they called Les Six. They were modernist 
young Apaches, they also called themselves, and they were thumb, thumbing their noses at Impressionism, like Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, and Romanticism. They were going to do something very modern and different. But what I think makes Poulenc's music endure, perhaps more than the others, is he had a real gift for melody. <laughs> so you will definitely hear it in this piece, the intermezzo in A-flat major. It's a gorgeous piece that he wrote in the 1930s, and uh, Arthur Rubinstein was a great champion of this intermezzo. Thank you. That was one of those 
pieces that I wanted to dance around the room to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Well, that was Poulenc's Intermezzo in A flat major, played live by Deborah Lou Harder. This has been really fun. Uh, now, Deborah is playing a program called The Human Need for Melody at Music at Bunker Hill in Sewell, New Jersey on Sunday. But that's I understand right. that it is sold out or nearly sold out. I think it is. That's that's what I've heard, that it's sold out. And thanks to everybody who bought tickets. And um, I don't know if there will be some ticket turnbacks, but you can always visit the website, musicatbunkerhill.org, or maybe call the phone number and, and find out uh, if you can get tickets. But uh, it was just a joy to speak with you, Susan. You're a wonderful colleague and interviewer, and uh, just so much fun to play uh, this well, beautiful music. It's been a lot of fun. And you can revisit this whole program on mm -hmm. WRTI.org, where we will have a video link. So it's been lots of fun, and we'll look forward to more conversations. Thank you. Thanks so much. Back to you, Bliss. <laughs>